morning, OCCC. Um, morning. We are finally back. It feels good. Um, I think the first time I guest spoke here, it was actually sprinkling and drizzling and you know, being back here again today, it was sprinkling and drizzling this morning, which shocked me because it's June, it's almost July. And I, I did not expect to be using my wipers as I drove to church this morning. Um, yes, it's good to be back. We will be opening up in about two weeks or so, so be on the lookout for some more information on that. Also, um, if you are able today, uh, please go to tinyurl.com forward slash OCCEC dash docs and download the sermon uh, notes for the message today. Our passage today comes from Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 through 9. I don't believe we have it on the overhead. However, there is a Bible app on the laptop. If you look on the bottom, uh, if you click on either logos or, yes, the green one, the green circle, Bible study. Joshua what? Joshua chapter 1. And if you uh, right click that tab in the middle, or just click the tab in the middle, this a one? little lower, the arrow, yes. Or just click on it. There we go. You know, it's, it's our, actually, it's the first service back in the main worship room, and we are a hot mess, but we are gracious, and we are thankful for the Lord. Um, there's actually ladders, there's wires hanging. We had a lot of trouble uh, with the AV and the overhead stuff, but God is gracious. We have an awesome team. They work so hard to even get this screen up here, and so we're very thankful for that. Please be sure to uh, give a clap on the comment section below. You know, one of the things, um, I, I think looking at the, the screen on the phone, what's being projected is that we're, we're kind of dark right here. And I was thinking, you know, we should have prepared better, maybe we could have got more light up here. But as I was looking at that screen, I realized the things that are lit. The Word of God is lit, and the cross is lit. I mean... Praise God for that. It is the cross that should be magnified. It is the word of God that should be glorified. And so it's okay if I sit in darkness as long as the right things are being lit. So praise God for that. Our passage reading comes out of Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 through 9. Please give your full attention to the reading of God's word. Holy and inerrant word. This is what it reads. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord... The Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people, into the land that I am giving them to, giving to them, to the Lord, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot would tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen. This is the holy and inerrant word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. 
You know, today uh, we are actually kicking off our new series in the Old Testament book of Joshua. Joshua is probably one of the most important books for young Christians as well as new believers to understand because it reveals and exposes so much light and insight on how to live the Christian life, which is something we normally wouldn't expect from an Old Testament book. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 6, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. It talks about all the things, um, it, it picks out certain things that took place a long time ago. And in verse 6 it says, Now these things took place as examples for us. The book of Joshua isn't just revealing historical events that took place a long time ago which they did. It, it was historically accurate. It, these events historically took place. But they are just more than historical events to be remembered for us. It is history to learn from. History that was written down to teach us about the Christian life. And so when we study the Old Testament, we'll find the New Testament truths and principles illustrated in a physical, relational, and a narrative form for us to understand and grasp. So the context leading up to the book of Joshua, you know, just briefly speaking, um, I'm going to gloss over a lot of this, but the Israelites were slaves in Egypt for about 400 years. God sent Moses, 10 plagues followed, God set his people free from slavery. They passed through the Red Sea and they were on their way to the promised land. Now, the promised land is not, a, is not symbolic of heaven. It's not a type of heaven. It's not reflective of heaven. You know, when we get to heaven, there's not going to be walls of Jericho to, to pray over to fall down. There's not going to be giants to fight or wars to take part in. There's not going to be sin to weep over in heaven. No, none of this. The promised land, no, the promised land is, is the intended life for God's people. The intended life for God's people. Yes, it is a physical land, but it is more than just dirt and, and rivers and hills. It's the promised life that God intended for His people. It's like a degree from Harvard. You know that, that piece of paper that costs about $200,000? Yes, on the one hand, it's just it's an exalted piece of paper. However, on the other hand, it, it represents something else. On the other hand, it represents a different life that is now available. Potential and possibilities that before did not exist. Opportunities that are now opened to us because we have that piece of paper. That paper, that degree from Harvard is a reflection of the different life that is now ours. All you have to do is go and take it and take possession of it. And that is what God intends for all of us. See, the moment we're saved, the moment we're redeemed, the moment God forgives us of our sins, the moment the Holy Spirit comes and, and revives us and restores us into a right relationship, the moment that, that God separates us from the hand of Satan and death, God intends for His people to go and live the victorious Christian life, to live the new life that He has given us. When God set the Israelites free from slavery in Egypt, He did not intend for them to wander around for 40 years in the wilderness to perish. And just like us, when God saves us and redeems us and brings us to life, He does not intend for us to wander around in life in the wilderness, but rather to go forward and take possession of the life that He has promised us. Now, in our passage today, God lays out the essentials for what it means to take possession of the promised life. 
as Joshua enters into the promised land and takes possession of it, it's a reflection of how we are to enter the Christian life and to take possession of the life that God has given. And so it begins with the understanding of our possession in life. In order to take possession of the Christian life, we actually have to understand what our position is in life. You know, in, in Acts chapter 8, there's a man named Simon who saw the Christian who thought that the Christian life was about power. He saw, that the, he saw the power and the ability that God gave to his apostles. And he saw that and he wanted that. Some Christians today refer to themselves as Christian witches because they want to have power to do miracles, power to speak in tongues, power to do all sorts of acts of power, as if the Christian life was about power. You know, in Acts chapter 5, the Christian community was in a state of generosity. People were selling fields, they were selling their homes, and, and giving the money to the church. And there was a couple named Ananias and Sapphira. They got swept up in the movement and sought the reputation of generosity. And they lied about what they were given. As if Christianity is just about having a certain reputation in amongst your friends or, or the church or where you work. Don't get me started on Judas. You know, Judas in John chapter 12, when the woman came and broke the jar, alabaster jar and anointed Jesus, Judas took the moral high ground. He said, you know, we could have sold this money for a year's worth of wages and given it to the poor. But Judas didn't care about the poor. He just wanted to pocket some of the money as if Christianity was a way of being prosperous in life. There are so many, so many misconceptions about what the Christian life is in our society today. But even back then too, you know, there was a mother of two of the disciples of Jesus Christ who brought her sons to Jesus and he said, and she asked Jesus, put my sons on your left and right of your throne in the kingdom of heaven. As if the Christian life is about positions and authority. Friends, the Christian life is, has been, and will always be about servanthood. Three times in our passage today, Moses is called the servant of the Lord. He was a servant of the Lord, it says. Three times in our passage Moses was the one that God used to perform countless miracles and perform works of power that astounded even the non-believers into saying, it's the power of God, it's the hand of God, the finger of God that is at work. But, what is he remembered as? What is he called for all of eternity? He's not called the person who brought the Israelites out of Egypt. He's not called the person who split the Red Sea. He's not called the person that, that performed the ten plagues or, or, or hit a rock and caused water to gush out. Rather, Moses is known for all of eternity, written down in Scripture as the servant of God. After all his accomplishments, after all the miraculous works that he performed, he is known as a servant of God. You know, too often we think that, you know, to be a servant of God means to serve in the church, that we have to volunteer or in the church or in some organization, lead some type of group activity or, or something of that sort. But don't limit our view of servanthood, rather widen it. We show ourselves to be His servants by serving God wherever we are. And there's two places that we can have the greatest impact and, and prove to be servants of God. First, in the home. Second, in work or in school if you're still a student. These are the two places that we can have the greatest impact to show ourselves to be servants of God simply because of the amount of time we spend. There is no place that we spend more outside of our home than at work or at school. So maybe we just need to take a step back and think, 
in my workplace, in my home? Am I showing myself to be a servant of God? Am I a servant of God? Or am I just serving myself or others? You know, do I display the servanthood? Do I display a servant's lifestyle? In my words, in my speech, in my actions, do they serve the Lord? You know, in the parable of the sheep and the goats, the people were surprised when Jesus said, I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was naked, and you clothed me. And to the people that Jesus said this, they were all surprised because they never did that for him. And so they asked Jesus, Jesus, when did we see you hungry and give you food? When were you naked and we clothed you? When were you in prison and visited you? They asked him. And Jesus said, as you did to them, you did to me. In other words, they were servants of God, serving God everywhere they went. Whatever they did, they did it as if they were serving the Lord. And they found out later that in fact, they were serving the Lord as His servants. The promised life is about servanthood. And secondly, uh, what's the, secondly, it's about a heart that is moved by the promise of God. Okay, that is, <laughs> that's not where we are. Uh, could you move forward? Forward, 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 or up? I'm looking for a map. That map. Okay, that map. Yes, that map. Okay. You know, it's... Uh, sometimes when we make mistakes and when it's not as smooth and professional as it seems, like we get nervous, we get, we get like, oh, ashamed. But on the flip side, I, I, I really must appreciate and glorify God because He takes unskilled servants to use to bring about His work. And so it just displays the, the humanness of us and our frailties. And so we worship God who calls us and allows us to worship Him and to take part in this. And, and so it, it's, it's a glorious um, opportunity to serve and we love it and we praise God that much more. Our weaknesses only shows God's generosity. Secondly, um, it's about a heart that is moved by the promises of God. If we take a look at this image, um, this is actually the promised land on the left side of the river. If you look at that river going all the way down the middle, that's the Jordan River. That's kind of like the 57 freeway that splits or East Orange County and West Orange County from East Orange County. Now, if you look at the next slide, that circle right there on the right side, on the east side of the river, that's land that the Israelites have already captured. They fought the people there, they conquered them, they kicked them out, they settled there. It was a good land. It was a well-watered land. It was um, for agricultural societies. It was plentiful. It was a good land. They built homes. They, they had farmland. Um, they left their wives there to take care of the kids and to to take care of their possession. That land was already theirs. It belonged to them. They fought and they won and they conquered and they had it. Now the promised land on the next slide is that circle on the other side. Now if you look at this circle, it, it's about the same size as the land that they already have. It's just inverted. And you gotta wonder. They have all this land They've conquered, they put their lives on the line, they want it, they possess it. Why would they go through all the trouble and cross over to take the other land? Like why, why, why put yourself through more hardship? Why put yourself through more difficulty? You already have this nice land over here. Why go cross over to the Jordan River? Why risk our lives for something that we don't need? you could say. In verse 2 through 7 of the next slide, it reads this. Now therefore, 
Arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot would tread upon I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I think there's one more slide for the next verses. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong. Not that far. Uh, only to verse 7. If you read this passage again and again and again, one thing that pops up immediately is that God had given them a promise to be with them, to guide them, to give them to, for victory. In other words, it was the promise of God that moved them and pushed them to cross over and face difficulty and face hardship. If you look in this passage, God promises them land, a very good land, a land of milk and honey. He promises them invincibility or victory. I like to say invincibility because he says, no man shall be able to stand before you to Joshua. He promises them His presence. I will be with you. There, there's no additional requirement. There's no, I will be with you if you do this. I will be with you if you don't do this. I'll be with you. He says, I will be with you. The promise of God's presence. Then He says, I will not leave you. The promise of God persevering next to Him. And then He says, I will not forsake you. The promise of God's persistence. Friends, whenever I think about someone being moved and, and compelled by the promises of God, I can't help but think of Hagar. She's someone that doesn't get a lot of attention in the Old Testament. She is a mother in the Old Testament that was being mistreated so badly that she decided to run away while she was pregnant, while she was with child. And while she ran away, she stopped at this well and she's drinking water. And God appears to her and he starts talking to her. What are you doing? Where are you going? Um, what's going on? And, and Hagar has this beautiful conversation with God. She says, you know, my mistress is mistreating me. You know, it's a tough life. I'm going through hardships. I'm just running away. And God says to her, I want you to go back. And I'm thinking, why would you do this to this poor woman, God? Why would you tell her to go back? Why would you put her in the place of suffering, the place of hardship, the place of difficulty? But then in the very next sentence, God gives her an amazing promise. He says, I will multiply your offsprings to the point that they cannot be numbered. And out of this wonderful and tremendous promise that she has received from God, she goes back into difficulties. She goes back and faces the hardships. You know, about 144 years ago, in 1886, there was a man named Russell Carter who was teaching at Pennsylvania Military Academy. You know, he had graduated there about 20 years before. Um, same school, but just, you know, 20 years ago. And as he was about to send off his first um, class of graduates, young men and women, he knew what lied ahead of them, the difficulties, the hardships of trying to live the Christian life, of being a Christian. And he trained them and he mentored them as best as he could. But as they were about to graduate and to be off on their own, he felt a sense of weakness, a sense of inability to continue to support them and guide them. And so he wrote this one hymn. He's written many hymns that are very famous, but this one hymn in particular, it reads this. If you know the hymn, Standing on the Promises of God, I just want to read to you the second verse and the chorus. It reads this. 
standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of Christ my Savior. Standing, standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Friends, the Christian life isn't an easy call. It's not a call that is easily accomplished or lived out. It's difficult. It's hard. As Proverbs 25 teaches us, it says, When your enemy is hungry, feed him. If they are thirsty, give them water. In other words, the Bible calls us to kill them with kindness, which is the modern translation. Have you ever tried to kill someone with kindness that you considered your enemy? I mean, someone that was really bad to you or mistreating you or just picking on you. Did you ever try to kill them with kindness? It's not easy. It's difficult. It, it kills something inside our hearts when we try to kill them with kindness. But here's the promise. If we do, if we do kill them with kindness as the Word of God promises or commands us, then the promise is that we will heap burning coals on their heads. Translation, when someone is tearing into you, just being mean and nasty to you, and if we love them, if we're nice to them, if we're generous and compassionate, overflowing with love and grace, as we do that, their heads will burn, wondering, why? Why would they love me? Why would they be so kind and generous to me? Why would they treat me this way when I treat them differently? You know, I want to show you this picture of Dirk Williams, who was a 16th century Christian. He was persecuted for the faith. He was tortured. He was uh, starved. He just went through many hardships for the faith. Now, if you look at this picture, you see a man reaching out to, to save someone who fell into the, the lake that was frozen over but not in that spot. And if you look to the side more, into the background, you see three other people there. This image is the person with the hat reaching out to save is Derek Williams. As he was being tortured for the faith in prison, he escaped. And he ran away. And as he was running away, the person that fell into the river or into the frozen lake was the prisoner who was torturing him, the prison guards. And as he ran away, as he ran away, this guard fell into the river or into the lake. And he started crying out. But the other guards, fearing for their own safety, stood on the edge telling the other person what to do. Derek Williams heard his cries and his pleads for mercy. But he also knew that if he turned around and helped that person out of the water, it meant that he would be martyred. This person that tortured him, this person that, that you know, starved him, this person that would try to make him recant the faith, was now crying out for help. And Derek turned around, laid down his life, and saved that man. That was the day the prisoner, or the prison guard, was saved. But Derek was also martyred for the faith. He could have ran away but he chose not to. He chose to save the person that was tormenting him. And in doing so, salvation came to one other soul. If we desire to take possession of the Christian life, we have to understand that we are servants of God in this life. Not servants of ourselves, 
for our own pleasures, but servants of God. We also have to be people who are moved to action by the promises of God. But finally, be people who have a heart that is strong and courageous. You know, three times in our passage today, God calls Joshua to be strong and courageous. Now, what does it mean to be strong and courageous? Well, that kind of depends on the context. You know, when we're hiking, and, it, you know, I think a lot of people are hiking right now, and so be careful, please. But if you're hiking and you cross paths with a bear or, or a mountain lion, to be strong and courageous means you walk back slowly, facing the animal, without running. If you're on a date at the movies with the girl, which I think the movies are opening back up, but if you're on a date at the movies with the girl and a, a very, very tear-jerking, sad scene comes on, to be strong and courageous means don't cry. That's what it means for a, for a guy, okay? Guys, trust me on this. No woman wants to marry a guy that's a crier, okay? They want a sensitive guy, yes, okay? But they do not want to marry a guy that's going to be a crybaby, okay? So don't cry in front of them until you're married. Once you're married, you know, you got the ring that's an everlasting covenant until death do us part. And so, you know, let, let the tears roll down. But until you're married, don't cry. You know, I see some nods from our, our women in the audience, and so they are agreeing. Yes. If your boss is, is, is uh, yelling at you for something you did wrong, or, or maybe just because, you know, stuff flows downhill, if he's yelling at you for that reason, to be strong and courageous, it means that you keep your mouth shut, and you take it because job security and, and paying the mortgage is very important. That's what it means to be strong and courageous. You know, in our passage today, God gives us context of what it means when he says, be strong and courageous. If you look in the first uh, one, verse 6, uh, it says, be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. To be strong and courageous in, in this context and in this verse means to live with godly purpose. It means to live with godly purpose. Not live however we want, not live going from one thing to another, but he says, I, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to them. There's a purpose and there's an intention that God has for Joshua as well as for all the believers. And it takes strength and courage to live with purpose in life. It's easy to just go from day to day and just let, live life without having meaning or purpose. To go from one activity to the other to the next. But to be intentional, to live with meaning and purpose takes strength and courage. If you look at the next slide, verse 7 begins to read this. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn to it from the right hand or the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate, it on, meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. The second way that God's Word teaches us to be strong and courageous means to live according to the Word. To live according to the Word. To live according to God's Word will take more strength and courage than you could imagine. When everyone at work is living life differently and going with the flow, do you know what it's like to live in a godly manner? according to God's word. When people are working and taking money under the table or, or doing 
cutting corners. And God's word says, you know, to be honest. Do you know what kind of strength and courage it takes to live according to the word of God? Or maybe your family right now, especially with all the stuff that's going on in the culture, is, you know what, I'm going to step actually back away from that one, okay? But living life according to the word of God is not easy. It takes tremendous strength and courage to stand for the word of God. So many people today are just going with whatever everyone is saying, with whatever is popular, whatever society um, says. They're just reflecting and regurgitating. But to stand by the word of God and live by the word of God takes courage and strength. And finally, the third category of what it means to be strong and courageous is in verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Two key words here. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. To be strong, courageous in our Christian walk, in our Christian life, means to live life moving forward. For example, Moses. Moses gets this tremendous call from God and he goes to Egypt and he tells the people of God about how God is going to save them, redeem them, and bring them out, and everyone's praising God, and they're happy. Moses goes to Pharaoh, and he's like, hey, let my people go. Let the people of God go. And then what Pharaoh does is like, uh, no. And he takes away their straw from making brick. Um, during this time, the Israelites were forced to make bricks, and they take the straw away. And when you take straw away from making bricks, it becomes that much harder, and they're getting beat, and they're getting harassed, and the people of God were like, why, what's going on? And Moses comes before God. At the first sign of trouble, at the first sign of hardship, after receiving the word of God, receiving this tremendous calling, at the first sign of difficulty, he gets frightened, he gets dismayed, and he goes to God saying, why did you bring these people out? Why did you ask me to come here? Only bad things are happening. And he seems to break down. Joshua. When Joshua crosses over into the uh, promised land, as we'll see in a couple weeks. You know, victory over Jericho, the walls fall down, right? We know that story from elementary school. But then he goes to Ai, which is a small town. And so he just sends, you know, two, three thousand people to go and capture it. But then the people of Ai overcome the Israelites. And they have a defeat. And at the first defeat, after receiving all these promises, after crossing over the Jordan River, after receiving this great call to accomplish the work of God, at the first sign of defeat or hindrance or difficulty, Joshua falls down before God. He says, oh, oh God, what's going on? You know, why did you bring us over here? We should have just stayed on the east side of the river, even though the west side is the best side. We all know that. And he gets all sad about that. He says, oh, we should have just stayed on the other side and never come in here. Now everyone's going to hear about how we lost and we're going to be killed and we're going to lose and all our children are going to be slaves again. A straight pity party, isn't it? But isn't this somewhat reflective of us in our Christian walk. We, we, we make that call, we answer that tremendous calling to live life properly before God, and at the first sign of trouble, God, why did, you, why did this happen? Why, how come there's no victory here? How come this isn't working? How come? Be strong and courageous. In other words, live life moving forward. Don't look at the past. Continue to move forward in Christ. That's the calling of the Christian life, to move forward, to move forward and to conquer and to be victorious. We fall down once, yes. We fall down twice, yes. And we will fall down many more times. But the grace of God is there. The promise of God is there. The calling of God is there. The strength of God is there. Continue to move forward, friends. Have you guys watched the show Downton Abbey? Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Okay, all the old people, yes? All the young people, no. Sorry, young people. <laughs> Some young people, yes, too. Downton Abbey. Uh, it's a great show. It's a fun show. It's a very clean show, which is a good show. Um, but Downton Abbey, it's about this family, this, uh, this man named Robert Crawley, who, you know, about a hundred years ago, a hundred years ago was the Earl of Grantham. You know, that's about, an Earl is about four steps removed from the King. So you have the King, the, the Princes, the Dukes, and then you have the Earls. So about four steps removed from the King. So he's a very, very uh, high-ranking man. This man, Robert Crawley, has three daughters, Merit, Edith, and Sybil. Now, Sybil is the youngest one. She's, she's more open to different political views, and she's a wild child. But Sybil marries the family chauffeur, who is named Tom Branson. Um, that's a big no-no, especially back then. You know, you have, you have your positions of authority, you have positions, positions of servitude, Tom was just a servant, a peasant. He had no ranking, no standing in society. And for Sybil, someone who's the daughter of the Earl, dating him or even looking upon him was bad enough, she got married to him. And there's this whole story and all the difficulties. But once Sybil marries Tom, Tom's status from peasant rises all the way high to a nobleman. But then Tom grew up as a peasant. He worked as a peasant or a commoner. And so he's, he's learning how to live this new life that he's been given. He's still eating with the servants below, and the servants are like, what are you doing? You can't be here. You're, you're a lord now. And he's like, ah. And he struggles and he fumbles, but eventually he learns how to live life as a lordsman. And through this whole process, Robert Crawley, the Earl of Grantham, he did not like him. He did not like the idea. Not one bit. But once he becomes his son-in-law, once he's brought into the family, he begins to love him and to care for him and guide him how to do and how to be a proper person. And he's showing him and molding him and shaping him and lifting him up. That's the book of Joshua for us, friends. The book of Joshua is not just Joshua going into the promised land and conquering it and capturing it. In one hand, yes. But in the other hand, it is our Heavenly Father teaching us through the life of Joshua and the conquest how to enter into the promised life that He has given us. How, how to live in it. How to take ownership and possession of what He has given us. The book of Joshua is the glorious story of how to live the Christian life. Because as we begin to live the Christian life, we will go through difficulties and hardships. And that is why the book of Joshua is so precious to the people of God. To the young believers, to the new believers, and even for the old believers to brush up on. So, if you are able, please go to OCCEC, go to tinyurl.com slash OCCEC dash responses. And if you go to this um, document site form, you will see a, a couple of options to respond to the message. You know, check A if you want to, if you will widen your understanding of what it means to be a servant. Not just being a volunteer in the church, but rather widen our understanding and horizon of servanthood and live it out daily, regardless of where we are, whether it's in the home, the workplace, whether we're shopping at Walmart or Target. Check B if you will make a commitment not to settle in the past defeats, but to move forward in Christ. Friends, we all go through hardships. We all have moments of defeat and moments of weakness. We all have that, and it just means that we're human. But God gives us grace, God gives us mercy, and God gives us His promises to continue to move forward in Christ. Check C if you will commit to reading daily so that we may live according to the Word of God. You know, you, you can't be strong, courageous, living according to the Word of God unless we are actually reading the Word of God, friends. 
check D if you will daily begin to fill your heart with, a, with God's promises so that you may be encouraged in difficult times. You know, I think D is, is one of the most practical things for young believers to do, to memorize scripture. Because when we go through hardships, when we go through situations that we question what we should do, by the grace of God, more times than not, we are reminded. Scripture begins to pop up into our head where, oh, this is what the Bible says, or oh, this is what God's word says, to lead us and to guide us and to be encouraged. Also, check D if you're interested in baptism class or becoming a Christian uh, and leave your contact information. We'll be having uh, baptism classes when we open back up and also baptism. Let me pray for us. Lord, we glorify you and praise you. We thank you. We thank you that you are such a good father. That you leave us not to figure things out for ourselves, to wander around in darkness trying to stumble in this life. But you, by, your, by the Holy Spirit, by your saints, have written your word down to guide us and to teach us and to shed light on how we are to live this Christian life. We thank you for the book of Joshua where we can learn how to live, how to face obstacles, how to confront defeat. We thank you that, that your people wrote it down and, and you preserved your word for us to read, to learn, to cherish. We ask in the coming weeks that you will give Pastor Ted and me great wisdom and insight into your word, word to discern properly how we, as your people in our generation today, may take your word and be guided by it. So that your word can lead us into accomplishing and inheriting and taking possession of the life that you have given us. Because of the work of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. Truly you are good. And you lead us according to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.